And another thing that kind of uh, struck home to me um, when I spoke in, in America uh, a couple of years ago is how we allow our world and our values and how we judge each other and how we judge others and what we feel guilty about or not guilty about to be decided not by what we think is right but be decided often by what people sometimes thousands of years ago believed was right. Because we don't, A, ask the question why, which is the most liberating question it's possible to ask, and B, have the courage and confidence to stand up and say, well, I don't think we should be doing this. I don't care how long we've done it. It doesn't make sense to me. I'm going to do it another way. Um, last time I was in Liverpool, I told the story, but for those, those who weren't there that night, it's worth repeating of um, the lady in the audience when I spoke in Houston in Texas who came up to me afterwards when I've been talking about all this and she said um, you know I've got a story she said that sums up what you're saying she said when I was um, when I was first married she said I used to cut the corners off the ham before I put it in the pan and put it in the oven you know she said and one day my husband came up to me and said why do you do that she said, I don't know, my mother used to do it. What's it matter? You know. So he said, well, why did your mother cut the corners off the ham before she put it in the pan? She said, I don't know, my, my mother, she just did it. What's it matter? He said, call your mother and ask her why she cut the corners off the ham. So she calls her mother and uh, she said, Mom, you know, you know when I was a girl and you used to cut the corners off the ham, and why did you do that? Her mother said, because my pan was never big enough. And if you kind of uh, look at the world in general from the perspective of that simple tale, you can see that so much that we accept as conventional wisdom is merely existing for the want of the word why and the courage to say, well, I'm going to do it another way. If we don't start to do that, then we are the mouse in the tube, thinking we are free while going on doing as we're told. And that will have great consequences for our children, to say the least. It's that everything in creation is the same energy in different states of being. Uh, just as water, clouds, and ice are the same substance in different states of being, so everything that exists is the same energy in different states of being. And energy is also consciousness. Some more enlightened, open-minded scientists are now suggesting, and have been for some time, for instance, that it can be shown that water has a memory. Well, water as a memory seems to be crooked. That's crazy. It's water. How can it, I can't have a memory. But it can have a memory if energy is consciousness. Because therefore, everything has some kind of memory, some kind of retention of experience, whether it be a, a wall, water, the sky, ourselves, whatever. So if that is the case, then what we're looking at in this infinite creation is one gigantic mind. And it's this mind, this one consciousness that is everything, expressing itself through different forms, that is the force that has become known as God, or whatever name you'd like to call it. Some people call it the infinite mind. It matters not. This God is not some guy with a beard sitting on a throne handing out punishments for people who don't do as he says. And it's always a he. Have you noticed that? It is the consciousness that is everything. And the way I see it, and increasing numbers of people see it, and indeed have done throughout human history, is that we are aspects of that whole. We, if you like, are like droplets of water in this ocean of consciousness. We're individual to a certain extent, but all together we make up the whole. 